welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast, with over 32,000 mental health professionals listening every episode. Why? Because we need to stick together to survive the mental health field. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. Welcome back to the podcast. I am here with Ariana Cunningham, a now PGY1 psychiatry resident. She did the microexpression series with me. She's on my research team. Um, she'll be an author on one of the papers that I'm coming out with in the next couple months. And um, in this episode, we are going to be going through schizophrenia. It's going to be an overview. We're going to dive into some of the history, um, diagnostic stuff. We're going to go through um, treatment, both medications and psychotherapy. But we want to start off talking about schizophrenia and pop culture. Yeah, because I think this is how, for most people who maybe don't have a family member or, a, you know, someone in their vicinity who's going through this, this is really the first introduction is how it's portrayed in film. Yeah. And that's the case for me. Like, Beautiful Minds, that that film was the first time that I even knew that schizophrenia was a thing as a kiddo. I think that was the case for myself as well. Yeah. That particular movie, too? Yeah, this particular movie. So... um we're going to talk a little bit about the movie, and then what we're going to do is, if you're on my YouTube or my Instagram, we'll also post basically a, a separate dialogue that we're going to have about the movie. We're going to show clips. We're going to break down the certain symptoms that are in the clips, and um, kind of like I've been doing, I've started this thing recently on my Instagram and YouTube where I'm putting up popular clips of movies and then so talking cool. about it from the psychological perspective. And with an emphasis on teaching empathy, microexpression, connection, um, with the idea of trying to make it fun. So one of the things I noticed, I came out with my app, Emotion Connection, you know, it teaches microexpressions, but it's really hard to do. Yeah. Like it's really hard to get someone to sit down and spend, you know, 10, 20 hours to be able to master it. Versus sitting down to watch 10, 20 hours of Game of Thrones easy to do. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm trying to produce two of these a week. Hopefully that continues. And within a year, you know, if someone all of a sudden finds it and binges on it, hopefully their empathy, psychological mindedness, you know, even like there's one clip we did where we, I talk about arguments, how to fight fair. Um, so yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes to the YouTube page and to my Instagram page as always. Yeah. And um, be ready for this to come out where we go through each clip. But tell yeah. me a little bit about the movie and the character oh, yeah. and some of the things that were jumped out. And we're there's going to be a spoiler alert here. Because, yeah, so you know, if you haven't seen this film, maybe... Maybe pause it right now. Go, go watch, watch it. Go watch it <laughs> and then come back. Okay. Because it is a great film. So this is the one. It came out in 2001. It's based on a real life person who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. There's... Got to say, there's a lot of commentary and backstories and people critiquing, like, was this a true diagnosis? But for the sake of how it's represented in the film, this is a portrayal in popular culture that's really formative to a lot of people's understanding of what schizophrenia is, what it looks like, what the symptoms are. So it's based on the life of this brilliant mathematician, John Forbes Nash Jr. Um, it's also based off of a novel that was written about his life. And there's definitely some differences between the novel and the film itself. I haven't fully finished it, but I think it's like, it's an interesting read. It's also a great movie. Whatever your camp is, just go for it. But definitely, definitely jump into that. And it outlines basically the story of this guy in the film coming into university. And then you start to kind of see things little by little go wrong. And then partway through the film, you have an aha moment with the character. I don't want to know how far should we go into spoiler alerts here. I think here. we should just go full okay. spoiler alert because it's like, it's, yeah, we should do it. We should yeah. do it, yeah. So in this guy's like life progression of coming into university, he's a little bit socially off. He says like his teacher once told him he got two helpings of brain and half a helping of heart and all these sorts of differences in how he struggles to connect with people are really portrayed. But then the real like well bang moment comes when you realize that some of these friendships and characters you're introduced to as the viewer are actually visual hallucinations of his, not real people. I think there's a really important 
the first important thing is that there is a prodrome for schizophrenia mm-hmm. where people are a little bit more, they're more socially withdrawn. They don't have as many close friendships or they don't have as many romantic relationships, which is often a question I ask when I'm trying to discern, is this person schizophrenia? Mm-hmm. Is like, what was this guy as an adolescent, early adulthood? Um, yeah, so it has some of that. He's yeah. a little bit off. And sometimes it can it can almost look a little... Asperger's or autistic. Yeah, and that's where some of the... Yeah, there's a lot of commentary around this film from the psychiatric community kind of saying, like, is this really a good way to portray it? And that's something we'll definitely dive into. But I think certain aspects, like you said, with that social awkwardness, like the opening of the film, he's, like, sitting in the back of the room, not really relating to people, in attempts to joke and make friends. He ends up kind of being offensive mm-hmm. without meaning to. And that and that's not something I see in a yeah. lot of the schizophrenic patients I, I, I treat. So that would be, I, there's a difference between a little so, social withdrawal compared to like being unnecessarily offensive. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> rubbing people the wrong way, kind of rough edges, which is definitely emphasized in the film a lot. And, you know, that's that's fun. I mean, it's Hollywood. Yeah. So it makes it interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the other thing that comes to my mind with that is um, we have to take into account his his intellect and how that changes the nature of his delusions and his perceptions because this guy's intellect is like off the chart. Yeah. And so the, the detail and the um, complexity of the delusions will be almost akin to that complex. So that's one thing I've found with different patients I've treated is the more um, kind of like highly I, educated, the higher or... educated, higher IQ, like they're making connections with things that it can really draw you in. Oh yeah, and you can be all of a sudden like, well, wait a minute, like, are we in this conspiracy? Yeah, are we in this sort of thing? And there's a certain like eloquence, and there's just a few patient interactions I've had. I come away being like, I just feel like they were dropping like profound reflections, and it, definitely they are not able to function in society in the same way if this is true schizophrenia, but there's a degree yeah, that's just really fascinating yeah. about how this disease manifests in different people. Yeah. And whereas like someone who's more um, average IQ or whatnot, when they, when they talk about the delusions, it's a little bit more identifiable to me, but mm-hmm. reflecting back on some of my early patients, I almost got pulled in to a couple of them. Mm-hmm. Like one guy saying his parents tortured him and, you know, all these things. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, well, maybe it's true. Yeah. Maybe his parents were really abusive. But then as the story came out more and more, like parts of the narrative were just impossible to happen. Like my parents kept me up for 10 days straight, tied me to a chair, you know, tortured me in these different ways. And the more and more he told me, the more and more I thought, okay, this is, th- there's something about this that's just impossible. Yeah. And that's something that comes out in the film is because it's um, this character and the real life person behind the character that's portrayed in the film is involved in helping like crack codes when it comes to in a wartime measures and looking for patterns and things. But it goes beyond what he was asked to do in a job and into a conspiracy that is confabulated. And a lot of people around him are unsure what to believe uh, until the secrecy is kind of pulled away around his measures. So, yeah, like you said, it's just Con- Connecting it's the unconnectable. The, yeah. Some of them really try to connect all sorts of things that um, are unconnectable. Like one schizophrenic man that I knew that was off meds um, who was telling me about how he flew overseas and he was in this parade and he noticed that God was communicating him directly to go to this hut. And he went to this hut and he met this man and he had this three hour conversation about fish. And he knew that it was important to like, um, you know, therefore, you know, go get on a boat. And so he got on a boat Mm. in this Asian country and he stayed on the boat for three weeks and worked with this team fishing, you know, and it was like all these sort of like felt directed. And, and the more I listened to him, you know, and I knew that this guy had been on Clozeril and he had been on some other psych meds before. And I was like, you know, this guy probably like, it's really fascinating oh, how he's connecting yeah. all these things and feeling guided, but how, because he's very, very smart. Like I was in a group listening to this guy, 
like multiple people were kind of bought into this mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Okay, go on a little bit about oh, the, the movie. It's so interesting. Yeah, so I think something that really stuck out to me, because um, I was reading different sources about and looking at the examples of how schizophrenia is portrayed in predominantly film, I think that was my main focus, is that there's kind of these two narratives of either being violent or a genius. And that's really like the predominant portrayals we have. And I think both of those things actually are brought out in the film, in his genius, like we were talking, like at baseline before he had any of this dysfunction of the disease. He was a brilliant person. He ended up winning the Nobel Prize later on, like really, really incredible as far as his lifetime achievements. Um, but there is also these elements that they bring out of hallucinations. And I mean, this is something to talk about too, is in the film, it's purely visual hallucinations. There's no auditory hallucinations. And statistically from what I was uh, kind of researching is that that may not be like the most common, like what we're seeing in him isn't what you would expect to see in most people with the disease state. Um, yeah, usually it's auditory hallucinations, delusions, and negative symptoms. Yeah, whereas for him, it was really predominant positive symptoms in the visual hallucination along with the paranoia. And then in terms of kind of some violence, he was less violent towards others. There's a few instances where he's trying to engage with the visual hallucination, like these these other, quote, people, and he ends up accidentally harming, you know, his family, his wife and baby in those measures. Um, but he's also engaging in self-harm because he has this fear that, like, there is something implanted in his arm, a chip that can be read, and he's trying to, like, dig it out of his skin. And some of those things that I don't know really how, yeah, if that's, like, a really accurate portrayal. Granted, this is Hollywood. Certain things are kind of yeah. almost amped up for the drama, I guess you could say. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that people think that in general, you know, when anything violent happens, they're like, oh, this person had mental illness. That's just not the case. Um, the majority of violence is not mental illness. Like the yeah. vast majority is not mental illness. There is a slight increase in violence in someone who's having their first psychotic episode. But overall, you know, it's not like people with schizophrenia are more violent than the average person. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's somewhere around 95% of people who do violent acts are not suffering from a primary mental illness. Yeah, I think like that. that's important to hold on to because I think even in this film, like once his disease is more known and you see the interactions of his friends around him and how that interaction is so different and guarded and he senses that and just how how disruptive that is towards becoming more functional in society again. There, There's an incredible stigma yeah. on mental illness and schizophrenia in particular. And it's... It's so much so that I tell my patients who are schizophrenic, who are high functioning, who are you know on meds, doing great. I say, hey, you may not want to tell people your diagnosis until you can really trust that person. Yeah. Um, because people don't know what to do with that information. People just have no schema, no framework hmm. to put it. No, absolutely. A few other, in case anyone out there is like watch these other films. Uh, there's Benny and June, which came out in 1993, a film called Snake Pit in 1948, one called Night Breed in 1990. And that was a kind of one of one of those like very violent emphasize as far as the portrayal. It's where like the doctor end up, ends up giving this patient with the diagnosis drugs and is ordering him to kill various people. Another film called Santa Sangre in 1989. Like this, this violent, uh, I guess, kind of storyline really has been portrayed a lot in film. And it, it gets understandable maybe why we have certain biases, just given what's been exposed to and what stories we've seen. Yeah, so I think that's kind of a... Hmm. Definitely okay. in the clips we can explore that more because yeah. the visuals of it are, are pretty impactful for those who have seen the film. Yeah, so, you know, I'd really appreciate it. Go check out the YouTube, subscribe or check out my Instagram. That's where they'll be posted. And um, probably a week or two weeks after we post this podcast, but we'll see. Maybe we, they can come out at the same time. Mm -hmm. So let's get on to schizophrenia in general. So typically they occur in young adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, on average, you know, the male who's 21, the female who's 25. And that's another commentary as far as like how we introduce this is that the character John Nash is apparently in his 30s kind of when all of this 
started. Granted, he's not alive today. This is historical report. But there's just, yeah, further things kind of in film that we need to refocus in on what the statistics actually show or the true picture. Yeah, yeah. And um, so one thing is it's, it's if, if you have a schizophrenic patient who's having their first onset of schizophrenia in their, in their 50s or 60s, I would really question that diagnosis. Yeah. I would really question it. Um, so lifetime prevalence? 03 to 0.66%. And um, causes are complex. Super complex. There's still a lot of debate about, you know, what could be. There are some things that we've found as far as associations for earlier onset and different things like that that we'll chat about. But it really is, to a large degree, something we just don't fully, we don't fully understand. understand. Yeah. yeah. And I would say with that, like for the people who say like, oh, there's no evidence of biological aspects of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Um well, there's probably like hundreds of studies. So yeah. be careful to say that. Yeah. Um, there's just so many, it's it's so complex. And there's, I think schizophrenia could be a final common pathway for multiple, um, for multiple priming events and genetic events that have, you know, and epigenetic events. So an, another really interesting thing that I posted in previous episode on marijuana was that, um, frequent marijuana use can increase the risk of a psychotic or schizophrenic yeah. illness about four times of what it would be otherwise. So that's, that's very concerning. And I think that's very strong evidence. Yeah. So there's many things that can sort of prime or lead to, or be a part of, do you want to say any more about that? No, I think the, the next fit that we're getting into yeah. for me that's, personally, that's your favorite. this is my favorite is, you know, even as we look at like, why do we hold certain beliefs or biases that we do now and getting into the history and seeing how the understanding of mental illness at large, but specifically schizophrenia, this is, this for me okay. gets me going. Yeah, let's, do, let's do it. So we're going to go all the way back. Um, the earliest recorded kind of description of an illness resembling schizophrenia is found in 1550 BC in what's called the Ebers Papyrus in Egypt. Um, so this is like our first, if we can kind of put it thumbtacks along historical time point, this is the first time that we have something kind of as a description down, that people were observing this behavior. It was observed enough that there was a pattern and kind of a, a thought formulation around this. And then it's pretty good to understand too, even in current day understanding, that if we go back, there was really this understanding that psychopathologies were stemming from divine punishment. I think nowadays there's more generally an understanding that things have biochemical bases, that there are genetics at play, and less of a, like, your dad did something and a god is angry at him and the firstborn son is blighted by this. I think that really changes how we view people who are suffering from these. Um, and then as far as this whole, like, divine punishment thing, if we look in Greek mythology or even, like, the Judeo-Christian biblical texts, we can see like uh, King Saul in First Samuel in the Bible uh, that he goes mad after he angers God and somebody has to play the harp to keep him calm. And in 1563, there is a book called um, what translates to The Deception of Demons, which is the first thing, 1563 BC, that proposes that this might be from something as far as like a natural cause and not just demon possession or spiritual warfare or divine punishment. So I know that's a that's a whole lot as far as what formulates how we look at things now, but it's interesting to kind of rewind back and see that that's really a predominant thought process that's been in society going way back. Oh, there's there's still a lot. I get um, I get DMs and in my Instagram from people overseas that still are questioning, like, hey, is this mm. person possessed, or you know. And um, I think in America, we, by and large, we don't think in those terms as much anymore, but there's mm -hmm. certain, there certainly are people who do think in those terms. And interestingly, I was just, I was just asked on a, a DM by the, this one guy who's working in Turkey yeah. about, um, you know, he sees a lot of people who are going psychotic, believing that they're Jesus, believing that they're, you know, Muhammad believing that they're, you know, some sort of spiritual figure or 
that some sort of spiritual figure is angry at them and that they're possessed with a demon and cursed. Um, and he was asking like, what's, what's up with that? And he, he, you know, the thing is, is that often the culture that you're in will help govern the type of delusions and psychosis that you have. Yeah. So for example, I had a patient who was really into the brothers Karamazov, um, going through her PhD. She was at a, a university setting, got psychotic and believed that she was a character, uh, connected with Alyosha, you know? So it's like, she was in that world. That was what was meditating or she was meditating about like day and night as she was working on her PhD. And so when she got psychotic, that got pulled into the psychosis. Right. And in the same way I hear about people over, you know, in the Middle East who are it's a very strong Islamic culture who, it's, you know, themes of Muhammad and Quran and are pulled into it. And so there's often spiritual themes yeah. that kind of come into it. So that's, it's still very present. I mean, you go into the psychiatric hospital and there's probably two patients right there that are still thinking in those terms, like I'm possessed, I have a demon that's persecuting me. Or even family members who who might have a stronger reliance on that explanatory model as opposed to a more like biological genetic, and that informs how they help as a support system in encouraging medication compliance or not, if they feel like it is something that can be fixed through non-spiritual interventions, you know? Yeah, I had a medical student who was going through, his sister was going psychotic. Ooh. And the, the family was deeply religious and didn't want any medications. They wanted to, they continued to want to take her to spiritual practices. It was very clear schizophrenia to me. And um, so sometimes those kind of like the things that are helpful for people by and large, you know, dealing with the realities of, of the world, spirituality helps a lot of people. Sometimes it can get in the way of getting the treatment that's needed. Yeah. And sometimes I'll put it into spiritual terms for the family, like, hey, you know, this is, it, there, there's a common grace that we can experience through medications, you know, mm. or through good psychotherapy. Yeah. And understanding that this has been around for a long time, this thought process is helpful in how you speak to them. Kind of like what you're saying is like, just knowing the different thought groups out there when it comes to explanatory models. Yeah. The next kind of um, pin cushion that we have here in the timeline comes from Emil Kreplin. He's a German psychiatrist, uh, 1856 to 1926, kind of his time frame there. And he was the person that suggested in this sort of shift that I think we're seeing in some academic circles, at least uh, to be more biological and genetic in origin. The cool thing about him, because really like schizophrenia as itself is a tough thing to parse away from other presentations that look similar is that he differentiated what we call schizophrenia today from other types of psychosis. There was a term that we used that was uh, dementia preosox. I'm not sure how to how to pronounce that, but it was essentially like dementia of early life versus manic depression. And he kind of helped parse those apart because what he saw as schizophrenia as being an irreversible cognitive functional loss uh, he was able to differentiate that from what we would consider in like a mania, which might be more episodic in nature. And that's helpful, I think, for anyone out there is that when you have someone who presents, you know, let's say they're seeing things or hearing things or they're, you know, expressing things, you're like, this is strongly paranoid. This isn't founded in reality to look at the time frame and find out when did this start? Is this slowly progressive and worsening for years? Has this come and gone months at a time? Is this acute? Is this substance related? Like... He was really the father as far as understanding that that was a core part of making this diagnosis. Just yeah, so impressive to look back and be like, well done, psychiatric forefathers. Just good <laughs> observations. <laughs> that's good, yeah. And so for bipolar, you know, usually the pe person will be ramping up for several weeks without mm -hmm. sleep, um, you know, feeling like they're on a special mission, talking fast, um, racing thoughts, and their sleep goes down maybe to three hours a night to two hours a night where they're not mm -hmm. sleeping at all. And then they, somewhere deep in there, they get psychotic. Now you could have um, personality disorder and also get psychotic. And so you could be borderline personality disorder and have these sort of what they're called quasi psychotic episodes where they're hearing things, persecutory voices telling them bad things about themselves. Whereas, you know, maybe when you're not in kind of a dissociative stress state, you can kind of have an, 
the social veneer and not feel those intrusive negative voices. Yeah. Um, and then there's also delirium. Delirium is, you know, usually later in life, but if you have enough hits to the system, I think you can make almost any person psychotic. And in this sort of state, you know, people will see visual hallucinations yeah. often. Um, they'll, you know, grandma who's having a urinary tract infection will be seeing things, hearing things. And it can be very dis distressing for the family. Oh, yeah. In hospital settings, when I've seen that and people say, like, this is not my fill in the blank mom, grandma, wife, and just how heartbreaking that is to see such a drastic personhood change in front of you. Yep. So it's sensorium. So when I when I make the assessment, I'm I'm looking at the the trajectory, the pathway to the psychosis, the things around the psychosis. Are there drugs involved? You know, meth presents Oof. a little bit of a different picture of um, psychosis. Um, you know, in the height of meth use, you can get psychotic. Uh, you can hear things, see things, get paranoid, uh, and then you know when you stop the meth usually most of it goes away. Now, some persists and that can be very distressing. And, you know, like, I mean, if you watch movies, people on meth, they're like duct taping cardboard to their windows and they're ducking, you know, and isolating and doing all sorts of things. So, so yeah, it's important to get a clear history and sometimes the family is very necessary for this. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's important because you want to know, is this, uh, something that's progressively, you know, is this, is a person progressing into this? Yeah. Is it an acute thing from you know, drugs or um, some medical issue? Yeah. Or is it, you know, part of a manic episode? You're going to treat each of those people very differently. Oh, totally differently. So that's really, I don't know, it's just pretty fascinating to look back and see, like, who was the first person who identified that? So that was kind of Emil Kreplin around 1887, uh, to 1903, that, that sort of time window there when he made that differentiation. The next big player, as far as our understanding of schizophrenia, what we call schizophrenia today, is Eugene Bleuler. Bleuler. Uh, the, oh, my pronunciation is horrible. <laughs> How do you say it again? Bleuler. Bleuler? Something. Somebody will look that up and correct us later. But uh, he was the person, and I love finding out, like, origin of the actual word. He's the person who introduced the term schizophrenia at a lecture that he was giving um, at a psychiatric conference in Berlin. So the actual word itself uh, kind of roughly translates to splitting of the mind. Skizen means like to split friend mind itself. And this is cool. Like those are the Greek roots, but it also introduced what colors schizophrenia even now today with the fact that that how the name comes out, its actual origin and and translation really makes it sound like multiple personality disorder, like splitting of the mind. So that was something that actually kind of, there was like some confusion when you look over the historical documents between things because this was the word that he introduced for it. Granted, this uh, was further clarified by the, the next players in the game, like Kurt Schneider, who was another German psychiatrist, his time frame, 1887 to 1967. He coined... Um, some different phrases or terms to help us further clarify like what's going on. He improved the diagnosis of schizophrenia essentially by creating a list of what he considered to be first rank symptoms or like things that are typified in the disease course itself. So things that we've already talked about that you see in the character of John Nash, like hallucinations, thought insertion, thought broadcasting, uh, thought withdrawal, Passivity experiences, the delusions themselves, delusional perception. Wait, define thought withdrawal? Thought withdrawal. So this is, I had to look this up. This is when someone experiences that they're having thoughts removed from their perception by another person or influence. I think, and that's good to put side by side with thought broadcasting, which is where you believe that your thoughts, instead of being taken away from you, are being inserted into like if you're having a thought that you feel that the TV is displaying it, maybe you can clarify thought, that thought one. Broadcasting in, is like other other people can read your thoughts, yeah. know your thoughts. Um, thought withdrawal is you're having the thoughts removed. Like if I were having it, I would be having my thoughts removed by yeah. another person. So another person would be influencing me, pulling out my thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
And then that passivity experience is sort of the sense that someone else is controlling your actions, your body movements, your sensations. And I think I've seen a few of these on inpatient psychiatric units, especially the thought pro- thought broadcasting and the passivity experience. But it's, yeah. yeah. So this was kind of the first guy who really made a list instead of this vague, like people who are acting abnormal. He was like, sit down. These are first rank symptoms. When we see these things, especially in clumps together, we really need to be putting this uh, on the table as a possible explanation. And he, he essentially was like, we want to diagnose the form of the behaviors instead of the content of the behaviors. So it used to be that anyone who was, let's say, um, having weird thoughts about the church was clumped together, weird thoughts about the human body and its experience was clumped together, paranoid thoughts about their family members were clumped together. And now they're like, no, 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 instead of that, let's put them together by the types of things that they're having. So he was a big player as far as that goes. The next guy that we have up is... Um, Sigmund Freud, uh, maybe a few of you have heard of him, <laughs> 1856 to 1939. Um, he is someone that more so just kind of influences the general conception of mental illness at large. He wasn't as much specifically with schizophrenia from what I found, but just his perception of how early life and unconscious conflicts can influence things. I think that that was definitely worth to mention when we talk about our society's perception of mental illness and schizophrenia. Yeah, I mean, we could we could go on about Freud for a <laughs> while, um, but a lot of who he treated were not the severely severely mentally ill, and that's important for our conception of the, the types of patients he treated. Now, if you look at someone like Evelyn Sachs, who is a lawyer at USC. She wrote a book called The Center Cannot Hold. I read that. Um, that was interesting. I actually have a signed copy of the Ooh. book. Um, and uh, I heard her talk when I was at my, the Psychoanalytic Institute for two years. She gave a talk there because she's very into how important psychoanalysis was for her in particular and her journey and having that close relationship with another human being through the struggles so she is a great case study on on the integration of, of good psychotherapy and more of the psychoanalytic psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. Okay, keep going. That's cool. Okay, so the next thing that I, um, I think is really worthwhile in mentioning is once we hit, we've kind of gone through these people who are helpful in noticing that these behaviors might be a diagnosis, um, making arguments for you know, as we look back historically, what the source or causative factors might be, if this is natural, biochemical, or spiritual in nature. Um, Moving forward, it's really, really important to note that in the 20th century, around um, when Nazi Germany was in place, that there was some, there was a lot going on in the psychiatric world and with people who had mental illness. And I think a really big thing that happened was what we call, or what was called the Action T4 program, which was the involuntary euthanasia of the mentally unwell. So this started in 1939. It was officially discontinued in 1941, but it didn't actually stop until 1945. And I'll post up the articles if you want to read more about this, but it it's just pretty heartbreaking. There's in this Action T4 program an estimated 200,000 deaths that occurred. Um, and something, I just want to read a quick quote here is, uh, Dr. Carl Brunt and the Chancellor Chief Philip Boiler, this is a quote here, are charged with the responsibility for expanding authority of physicians so that patients considered incurable can be granted a mercy killing. Kind of in reading documents around this, though, it kind of looks like the inclusion criteria were not strict and oftentimes the economic status or productivity level of the individual in question might have played more of a role in that criteria. Yeah, just to, I think it's important to address where society has maybe really done a horrible job of taking care of people with this diagnosis. Horrible. And we're talking about an estimated 200,000 deaths. 200,000 in this program that only spanned really from 1939 to 1945 is when it actually ended. And it was even interesting that the order for when this came out was backdated 
to the day that World War II began so that it would appear to be a wartime measure, even though it actually was implemented later on. I mean, there was, I think it's important to state, there was like the Roman Catholic Church, there were some documents and protests, some physicians protested, including some psychiatrists. But overall, like this was even in the in the phrasing of it, to expand the authority of physicians and just, I don't know, maybe a, a moment for us to kind of reflect on truly what a vulnerable position it is in society if you have this and that you might lack a voice when it comes to. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the other, the other thing that comes to my mind is that in most big studies, the compliance rate is very, very low mm -hmm. towards the actual treatment. And so people who really need, really need the medications um, often don't get them. Yeah. And so, for example, like I think the rate is about, you know, 0.6 in the general population, whereas in the homeless population, it's like 20%. And so you have this um, incredible need for the people with the most severe mental illness to get treatment. But even in the county program, like how hard is it? You have to go to a walk-in clinic. Okay, that could be 20 miles away from you, yeah. um, from where you live. And uh, transportation is an issue. And then you have to wait for five to six hours sometimes mm -hmm. to be seen, or it may take four hours, you know, if you're just walking in. And in that time, all the stimulus may be so distressing that you'll just leave. Yeah. So this is where like, like act teams, teams that go in mm -hmm. to where the people live um, and I'm looking on sort of doing some of this stuff as well, where I live, um, partnering with, with, with different people. And I'm, I'm putting up a YouTube video of a recent talk I gave on homelessness, empathy, and connection and the importance of that. And one of the big things is that, you know, the most sort of at risk populations will not get treatment because they're so isolated in, the, in part of the delusions and the paranoia, they lose all connections with everyone. Yeah. You need a really, I think there's some studies that show kind of one of the main prognostic influencers is just your support system. And if you have, let's say, you know, a family that's invested in, in keeping you safe and well and setting you up and, and also helping with accountability when it comes to appointments and follow-up and medications. Yeah. Yeah, I had a patient on the inpatient unit who he was set up and his main thing is like, I have an apartment. My parents like help me out. I get some monetary compensation for his, the diagnosis, but that his life is really just consistent of like staying in his apartment and playing video games. And as long as he doesn't leave, he won't get in any trouble because it's interactions with humans that always seem to go awry. And then he's brought in by the police and, you know, kind of his life is 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 very small, but that's mm -hmm. how he can maintain a certain level of, so, of independence is, is by secluding himself. And it seems like a tough catch 22. And so one of the things that we've, I've, I've started discussing one of my best friends out here, he works um, full time with the homeless in the mm -hmm. city that I live in. And so he's on the street. He literally knows a hundred or so homeless people by name, knows their stories, know, knows a lot about them. And it's, it's taken years to develop those relationships. And so, um, so we've been in dialogue about like, well, what is the biggest need that these people have? And for him, his conclusion is relationship. Yeah. And it could be something small, like just giving your attention, you know, repetitively to someone over the course of a year or two. That's how he's built these relationships. Um, but there's so much paranoia. The system is against me. You know, all of this stuff leads to extreme isolation. And, and then there's the, the, the stress of being on the street, which is another really ongoing, unrelenting stress. And there's really no safe haven. And also the rates of trauma are so much higher. The rates of previous trauma before homelessness are so much higher. Um, often a lot of the people who are homeless are raised in the foster care system. So there's a lot of these stresses that lead someone down this road to homelessness. Yeah, And so it's something we'll be talking about more, I think, in upcoming episodes, like how do we address this as mental health providers? Mm. 
And even as you mentioned, because there's um, World Health Organization uh, releases every now and then some really helpful statistics. And one of the more recent estimates is, I know we mentioned earlier, 0.3 to 0.66 is kind of the U.S. average as far as um, the rates of schizophrenia in the general population. But within the population of people experiencing homelessness, the estimates are up to about 20%. So yeah, just what you were saying there is that this is really a, oh, it's a it's a tough situation because that's the exact position where you lack all those support and structures that help with a good prognosis and outcome and you know long term longevity there. Yeah, so I think I think what we'll do is we'll stop this episode actually. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe let's summarize some of the big takeaways from this episode that we want, and then in part two. Why don't we jump into clinical manifestations and start to go through treatment? Because kind of get um, into like the nitty gritty, nitty gritty <laughs> of things. Yeah, um, one of the big things that I think is a takeaway from here is um, the importance of connection, is mm-hmm. the importance of empathy for this group, and I hope that we're humanizing and sort of decreasing some of the fears. Like violence is not, although it's big in the the movies, it's not that big in real life. Yeah, like these patients are not incredibly violent people. Um, There's so many factors that lead to someone down this pathway that it's not, uh, it's not like a moral failure. Yeah. I think that's really important to emphasize because even if that's something you hold deep within and don't consciously process, maybe introducing an alternative explanation would really soften how you interact with them or how you greet someone if you notice them. Yeah. And then, um, what we'll be going through in the in the subsequent episodes is how how we can have empathy, like how we can be with someone who might have psychotic symptoms in a way that doesn't co-author the delusion, but actually um, can be present with the distress in the delusion. Yeah, I think something really wise that I, I think it was um, one of my attendings who I've worked with that they say even if the content of what they're saying is completely non-factual, not based in reality, there is no fill-in-the-blank organization or person following them, that their emotional distress from that perception is real and tangible and factual and in front of you. No matter what their explanation is or what their delusions are, their emotional experience in the midst of that is there. Yeah, and I think one of the other big takeaways is um, is that the age at which onset this occurs at usually is a younger age. Yeah. Um, And that this has been talked about throughout history. So it's not just like a a culturally constructed notion of what something is. And then there's there's a pattern. There's a constellation. Um, Social withdrawal early on in adolescence. And then, you know, auditory hallucinations and delusions and negative symptoms. And so in the next episode, we'll get more into the details. Of what those are, what those look like. What those are. Yeah. And uh, we'll go from there. So Ariana, thank you so much. Thank you. And we're just going to, we're just going to pause and record episode number two right now. So if this has been helpful for you, um, let me know, jump onto my social media. We'll post all of these notes on my resource library. If you've gotten it before, just recheck your email and just go straight there. And we will also be looking forward to some video highlights from this series. And in this series, I'm really hoping to go through some of the major diagnoses in the future and go through kind of the history and the pop culture stuff, but then also dive into what you need to know to be able to treat this population. So there we go. 